following the, amb the ambassador's remarks, we will have a, a, quite a lively question and answer session. The ambassador said, the ambassador said earlier that he wants your hard questions, not the easy ones. So uh, feel free to ask those. Uh, if you don't have those, I think several of you would have picked up these cards on the way in and just pass them down uh, toward, toward the end of his remarks and the staff will pick these questions up. Again, uh, we're very pleased to uh, welcome you here tonight. Uh, it, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, we're honored to have you here and uh, to be with us, and we, we hope, as I said earlier to you, that you'll consider this your home, and you, they say here in Houston, Mikasa Sukasa, you'll return many times, and we, we look forward to working with you as well. Uh, we have with us among our distinguished uh, guests uh, one of our good board members, and we want to thank him and his wife, uh, Shasta, for being sponsors for the receptions earlier. And now I would like to ask my friend Shazad Bashir if he would come forward and, and make the introduction of the ambassador. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. I think the first one doesn't work. That's a Astros ticket. That's for the 31st. <laughs> On behalf of the board and the members of the Asia Society Texas Center, and of course, the Pakistani Americans in Houston, it is my honor and privilege to welcome Ambassador Jelani to Houston. This morning, I don't know why, but when I got up, I curiously checked the weather for Multan. For those of you who don't know, Multan is a city in uh, Pakistan in the Punjab province, which is where the ambassador is from. And much to my pleasant surprise, the temperature in Multan and Houston today was identical. <laughs> A very pleasant 93 degrees. <laughs> also, as I started Googling uh, about Multan, and I've been out of Pakistan for 37 years, uh, so I was checking wh wh what I knew about Multan, and I discovered, and it seems that the rumor is that Multan has got a Bundu Khan. The ambassador is confirming that rumor. Well, Houston has got two Bundu Khans. <laughs> and, and those of you who haven't been there, that's a very, very nice grilled kebab place. So clearly, we've got a lot of common between Multan and Pakistan and Houston, the weather, the kebabs. But no, on a serious note, there is a lot more in common then what I've just said ranges from energy, the commerce we have, the culture, performing arts, and our interest in the mutual relationship between US and Pakistan, and most specifically, Houston and Pakistan. So we're delighted, we're delighted, Mr. Ambassador, that you're here. We thank my good friend Afzal for in taking the initiative to invite you. And that's exactly why we, as Houstonians, whether Pakistani American or otherwise, are delighted to note your visit and very excited to hear and learn more about Pakistan and about the political transitions in South Asia and the prospect of peace. One quick housekeeping point before I jump into the uh, intro. Uh, for those of you who want to participate in Maghrib prayers, Asia Society has very kindly organized a space upstairs in the water gardens immediately after the question and answer session. We'll have enough time, so we don't need to rush there, but Maghrib prayers upstairs uh, after the Q&A session. Allow me to talk about the ambassador's distinguished career, and I'm going to present a very quick synopsis. Ambassador Jalil Abbas Jalani assumed his responsibilities as ambassador of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan on January 2nd, 2014. Prior to his current appointment, he served as Foreign Secretary of Pakistan. Ambassador Jilani is a career diplomat and has also served as ambassador of Pakistan to Belgium, Luxembourg, and the EU. 
as well as Pakistan's High Commissioner to Canberra, Australia. And for those of you who may know, translate that, the High Commissioner is the ambassador position within Commonwealth countries. Ambassador Jelani specializes in South Asian affairs and has held other significant roles, including Director India, Deputy High Commissioner to New Delhi, Director General South Asia. He has also served as the government spokesman on foreign affairs and Deputy Secretary in the Prime Minister's Secretariat. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Ambassador Jalil Abbas Jalani. Thank you so much, Shahzad Bashir Sahab, for a wonderful introduction. Thank you, uh, our dear friend, uh, Charles Foster. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to be, uh, to be speaking uh, at this uh, very prestigious forum. Uh, the uh, Shahzad Bashir Sahab mentioned about the temperature uh, the, in Houston and in Multan, my home city, to be honest, uh, 93 is a pleasant, a very, very pleasant. This temperature goes up to 105, 106 uh, during summers in Multan. It is one of the hottest places. And I think that's, uh, that's the reason that Alexander the Great, he decided to abandon his campaign after he reached Multan. Uh, that's the place where he got injured and then left. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, uh, topic, um, uh, the political transitions in South Asia and its impact on peace and stability. Uh, this is uh, a very topical issue because uh, some uh, very interesting developments are taking place in our part of the world. Uh, Pakistan witnessed a democratic transition last year where one democratically elected government after completing five years, for the first time in the history, was replaced by another uh, democratically elected government. In uh, May this year, uh, we witnessed uh, a change of guard in India, where when BJP um, uh, won with a landslide victory uh, in, in India, and Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi uh, a, a, a somebody who remained controversial inside and outside India became the prime minister. Uh, but the uh, rise of BJP that we uh, witnessed was also phenomenal because it is the same party that had just two seats in the Indian parliament in the 90s, and from two it has emerged as the single largest political party, which perhaps doesn't really need the support of other uh, partners to form the government. And hopefully, uh, in the uh, next few days or few weeks, we will witness another political transition in Afghanistan. Although the, uh, the vote count, uh, there are some issues, but one, we are keeping our fingers uh, crossed and we are hoping that, that this transition also moves forward smoothly because that transition is of significant importance, not only to Pakistan, but uh, the region and also the entire world. Uh, in other words, I think uh, South Asia stands at the cusp of a new beginning. Uh, it's a fresh start with uh, new elected leaders, and that's also generates hopes in the region. But at the same time, the questions on the minds of many people in uh, South Asia, whether in India, whether Pakistan, or Afghanistan, other regional countries, or Washington, or other world capitals, the question on the minds of many people would be that how would this transition impact on the relationship between Pakistan and India, or for that matter, Pakistan and Afghanistan? Or uh, will the elected leaders in, um, uh, uh, in these countries 
they would, um, with their, with the new faces, whether we would witness uh, an acceleration of the peace process between the countries, uh, or it will slow further slow down. Uh, what would be the fate of the reconciliation process that was moving slowly in Afghanistan in the last couple of years, in which, during which uh, the United States of America and Pakistan worked very, very closely with the uh, Afghan government to put together uh, a, a process. And the, um, what would be the effects of military operations that we have launched in North Waziristan, an area which remained a part of uh, controversy for a number of years and had also become kind of a sore point between us, um, the government in Afghanistan, um, and also between us and Washington. Uh, what would be the effect of military operations on the overall peace and stability? And will um, Prime Minister Modi, will he, will he be able to start the dialogue process between Pakistan and India, which has been suspended in, since December 2012? Mine was the last visit to India in uh, June, June of 2012, when I, I, as Foreign Secretary, went to India to have, to have an interaction with my Indian counterpart, the former Foreign Secretary, Mr. Ranjan Mathai. And then um, uh, another question that uh, will the uh, uh, domestic politics in India, uh, would, whether it would continue to dictate uh, policy, uh, India's policy towards the regional countries, or would there be a change? And uh, will the countries of the region, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, would they be able to, to join hands in dealing with this most important issue, the issue of terrorism? Uh, I have no doubt that answers to these questions are going to be extremely difficult. Difficult because these are not easy questions, because the relationship uh, Pakistan-India has been a very complex relationship. The issues that are involved are also uh, very complex. But then, certainly, there are um, some positive signs. Uh, positive signs in the sense that in Pakistan, uh, there is a national consensus that we have to uh, improve relations with all neighboring countries, including India and Afghanistan. Uh, the economy, um, there is a realization that economy will not be able to revive. Our economy has witnessed um, uh, a, a slowdown or, uh, uh, you know, it was devastated because of the conflict in Afghanistan for the last 30 years. Uh, the, uh, besides uh, extremism and terrorism, uh, gun, gun culture, the drug culture, which was, which was alien to Pakistan, was introduced because of this uh, conflict in Afghanistan. Uh, all political parties in Pakistan during the election campaign last year, uh, peace with India, peace with Afghanistan, was the slogan on which most political parties, they won the elections. Uh, the Prime Minister, the new government in Pakistan, they have a vision of economic development coupled with peace in the region. This is the, the manifesto of the Prime, the Prime Minister's party, and this is what he has been trying to uh, implement since uh, taking over. And then uh, another positive development is that the, uh, uh, the economic uh, uh, vision and the, uh, uh, of our Prime Minister and Prime Minister Narendra Modi's vision to develop India economically, that's also, there is a convergence in that. Uh, and also, in order to create, uh, there is a realization in Pakistan that economic development cannot take place unless we are able to get rid of extremism and terrorism. And that is a realization that has, um, uh, uh, there in almost every uh, section of the society. And uh, because of that, the operations, when we launched these operations uh, in Waziristan, 
uh, not only in Waziristan, but also in the other urban centers where these uh, people, they had made their bases. Uh, they enjoyed the support of the people, and that basically, that is mainly the, res the reason that we are achieving great successes against these extremists and terrorists. Uh, and then, in, in order to improve relations with India, the Prime Minister of Pakistan visited India to uh, participate in the inaugural ceremony of the Indian Prime Minister. I think it was, again, a, a very bold decision on his part because when Prime Minister, when he was taking oath uh, last year, when he invited the Indian Prime Minister, the Indian Prime Minister did not respond positively. And there was obviously a, a controversy inside Pakistan as to why should the Prime Minister of Pakistan undertake this visit when uh, the, the similar uh, invitation was not responded to. By the, but then, uh, and, uh, and I think the meeting that the two prime ministers had, they were also, that was very positive, uh, that, those, that meeting. And both the prime ministers, they agreed to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to revive the dialogue process. The foreign secretary of India, uh, she was supposed to visit Pakistan on 25th, uh, two days, I think, day before yesterday, uh, to kickstart the uh, process. But unfortunately, um, India called off the, uh, the visit on a, on, a, uh, uh, on, on a ground which uh, uh, most of the uh, uh, analysts would find it, uh, uh, find it convincing. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, from our point of view, there was absolutely no justification uh, for the uh, uh, for the cancellation of the visit. Uh, uh, whatever the uh, the uh, underlying reasons, uh, I think it is certain that it has dented uh, the belief, at least in Pakistan, that uh, that uh, the new government in India was confident enough to to uh, to move forward on its uh, relations with Pakistan. Uh, uh, and I think uh, when I say that there is a consensus in Pakistan to have improved relations with India, uh, we feel that there are strong imperatives uh, uh, behind that. Uh, why imp uh, the, some of the factors that comes to my mind is that there is an awareness, not only in Pakistan, but also in India, that um, uh, there is no mil military solution to any of the disputes that we have between our two countries. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, I always maintain that all the previous wars that Pakistan and India fought, uh, we fought almost four wars, they were literally fought with bows and arrows and uh, with the kind of uh, sophisticated conventional capability that both the countries have. Uh, a war between the two countries would be devastating. And the uh, nuclearization of uh, South Asia has added another dimension to this uh, thinking. And then um, uh, also there is a realization in Indi India that India could not impose a decisive war uh, on Pakistan. And this is a realization that we witnessed during the uh, the, during the military operation, uh, during the military uh, mobilization uh, in 2001 to 2003, when one million Indian troops were amassed on Pakistan border, but uh, a war did not take place because of the same realization that I am taking to talking about. And then uh, there is a realization that neither country could achieve its economic potentials, economic uh, economy. Uh, we are with both countries joined together. Uh, we are uh, 1.6 or 1.7 billion people living um, uh, in, in, in these two countries. And uh, uh, there is a realization that we need to meet the non-conventional challenges like poverty, like uh, climate change, like uh, terrorism, like uh, 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 food security, etc. So these are some of the important areas on which uh, what is the uh, way ahead? Um, we feel that politics of the region is at a crossroads. Uh, Afghanistan uh, end game is approaching. 
uh, and um, uh, we have made overtures towards India. Um, Pakistan, the attitude in Pakistan towards India and towards Afghanistan has also changed dramatically. And uh, uh, all these factors, they, uh, they basically uh, compel us to uh, move forward in this uh, relationship. But this uh, 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 improvement of relationship, in our view, cannot take place um, uh, by following an approach that we have been following in the last um, almost 67 years. Uh, from if you look at the history of those of you who are interested in the history of Pakistan and India, they would realize that from 1947 uh, till uh, almost 1998, we followed an on-off approach. On-off approach during which we were talking and we were fighting at the same time. After the nuclearization of South Asia in 1998, uh, the uh, strategy that was being followed was the strategy of, uh, uh, of you know, somehow managing this relationship, managing this relationship uh, whereby you used uh, political and diplomatic tools to ensure that uh, the tension does not uh, uh, cross a certain point, uh, you don't go to war, and that you uh, uh, basically uh, somehow um, uh, remain uh, uh, maintain this relationship at a uh, certain level. Uh, but I think uh, a lasting fee, uh, uh, peace between India and Pakistan will not be achieved uh, by um, either following the on-off approach or by following the managed relationship approach. We will have to, uh, to um, uh, uh, adopt a problem-solving approach, a problem-solving approach whereby uh, we, uh, both the countries, uh, they uh, take a determined decision to resolve all our issues uh, between the two countries uh, in, a, uh, in accordance with international legality, uh, in accordance with, uh, uh, with the norms, and, uh, 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 and move forward. Uh, you know, that is something uh, um, um, uh, uh, that is something which is extremely important. Uh, uh, the, uh, we are seeing that the whole world has changed and uh, South Asia is also changing and we need to change. Uh, we need to change and we need to grapple those issues, whether it is Kashmir, whether it is Siachen, whether it is water issues, whether it is terrorism, we need to grapple them head on and we need to cooperate. Uh, on those issues uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, closely. Um, uh, I think it's, again, important that uh, we can't follow a wooden-headed approach of the kind that we have been following for the last many years in terms of, in, for the resolution of the issues. Uh, uh, we will have to basically uh, um, get out of that mode. Uh, the convergences of our respective agendas, the economic revival and an end to terrorism, I think that is something which is of uh, paramount importance uh, between uh, our, our countries. Afghanistan, as a close neighbor, uh, Pakistan um, shares multiple ethnic, uh, religious, and cultural commonalities with people of Afghanistan. Uh, we have we share a border which is 27 almost 2700 kilometers long border with Afghanistan uh, uh, but at the same time uh, I think we have suffered the most uh, as compared to any country in the world because of the conflict in Afghanistan uh, when I tell my children that when I was studying in, in college and university in the 70s or 80s, um, you know, there were, uh, Lahore was full of life. Uh, the kind of things which are happening now, we were, were completely alien to our country. So they get surprised. Uh, but the fact remains that it has seriously impacted on almost everything um, in Pakistan. Besides millions of refugees, 
that we have to host in Pakistan for the last 30 years. Uh, as I mentioned, that um, the gun culture, the um, uh, drug culture, uh, and other, uh, and extremism and terrorism, that also were introduced in Pakistan. Uh, and we um, uh, continue to uh, face the uh, face the problem because of the uh, because of the ongoing instability in Afghanistan, and that's why uh, we are uh, we are uh, hoping and praying at the same time that the situation in Afghanistan settles down, so that we are able to 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 uh, to get rid of all these distortions that have set in in our, uh, uh, our society. Uh, so that's something that is uh, 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 very, very important. Uh, talking about Afghanistan on the positive, positive sides, there again, uh, some positive developments have been taking place. Uh, no matter what anybody says, but the presence of the US and ISAF forces for the last 10, 12 years, has certainly uh, done some positive things. For instance, a, a political infrastructure is in place in Afghanistan. Uh, a security, a, a, a almost 300,000 uh, strong uh, Afghanistan national security forces there. And the Afghan national security forces during the recent elections, they, I think, did a remarkable job in um, warding off the uh, attacks from Taliban and other, uh, other people who wanted to disrupt the elections. Um, elections in Afghanistan have been relatively peaceful. Uh, front runners are educated people. And both Abdullah Abdullah and um, uh, Mr. Ashraf Ghani, they are educated people. And I uh, have reason to, and we should have reason to believe that an enorm enormous responsibility rests on their shoulder that they have to basically try and uh, uh, but uh, uh, rather than sort of getting mired in their um, personal uh, differences, they should they will have the uh, the future of Afghanistan uh, that would take priority. Uh, this time, we have witnessed that there has been less or no outside interference in in Af in Afghanistan during the election, and that is something that is a wonderful thing, and that has uh, been recognized by the by the Afghan, both the candidates. Um, uh, the, uh, another important thing is that the election results in Afghanistan, they were not predetermined. Uh, for instance, in both the previous elections which were held in Afghanistan, uh, everybody knew that it is Mr. Karzai who is going to become the president. And the uh, election is just kind of a, uh, uh, a, 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 an exercise. But this time, uh, nobody knew as to who would win the election. Um, there were opinion polls which were saying Abdullah Abdullah is a front runner. There were opinion polls who were saying Ashraf Ghani has been a front runner. And even today, nobody knows as to who is going to be the front runner in the, when the election results are finally announced. Uh, another very positive thing about Afghanistan is that there has been no separatist tendency in Afghanistan. Despite 30 years of war, we have not witnessed that separatist tendency. We have not seen any movement in Afghanistan that, would, that people would be interested in. The South should become independent. Uh, North should become independent. They should become, uh, there should be division of uh, Afghanistan. Nobody talks about the division of Afghanistan, which is, again, a very positive thing. Uh, and then there, is, there are no sectarian issues. Uh, you have all kinds of ethnicities in Afghanistan. You have Shias, you have Sunnis, you have Hazaras, you have uh, um, Uzbeks, but there is no tension, ethnic tension. And uh, the important thing is that the, both the candidates, they were wise enough to select their running mates uh, in a wise fashion in order to bridge the ethnic gap. Uh, Mr. Abdullah Abdullah, he had um, a, a strong Pashtun um, a person, uh, an, an Islamist, uh, as his uh, 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 first vice president. Second vice president uh, was again a Hazara. And again, it, uh, other people that uh, were supporting him, they were from different uh, ethnic background. And same was the case with Mr. Ashraf Ghani. Um, 
But the point is that despite these positive, uh, posit uh, po positives that we have seen in Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan continues to face challenges. And uh, from our point of view, overcoming these challenges uh, would require both preventive and proactive measures. Um, uh, pre preventive measures from our point of view would include um, enhanced border security because um, we need to enforce enhanced border security between Pakistan and Afghanistan. After the drawdown of uh, U.S. forces and ISAF forces from Afghanistan towards the end of uh, next year, uh, the bulk of the responsibility to maintain order uh, would rest on Pakistan. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, we have already uh, increase the number of uh, our troops on the border from the previous 150 to 175 now. And this is something that uh, also helped in, uh, in, um, uh, in reduced violence during the elections because we uh, discourage this movement across the border. Uh, but then en enhanced border security would also mean that we need to put in biometrics on the uh, border. We need to limit the crossings to uh, just the formal crossings between Afghanistan and Pakistan. You would be surprised to learn that uh, today, on a daily basis, almost 50 to 60,000 people, they cross that border without any visa or without any documents. And these are the easement rights that the people of Afghanistan, they enjoy for the last many, many uh, centuries. Uh, many of these 50, 60,000 people who come from Afghanistan, they come to work in Pakistan. They spend the um, day in Peshawar or other cities, and then in the evening or after a couple of days, they go back to Afghanistan. So this is the kind of uh, situation that we are talking about. Uh, development of defense and intelligence cap capability in Afghanistan would be of crucial importance. Counter-terrorism and counter-narcotics measures will have to be undertaken by the new government. And then an inclusive reconciliation process is something which is of paramount importance. Because when we say that the inclusive uh, reconciliation process, it does not mean only a reconciliation with Taliban, but also in a, a reconciliation. Uh, with almost everyone. And I think the, uh, the agreement, which was um, 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 uh, uh, between the two um, uh, candidates uh, promoted by the U.S. Uh, of having a national government of national unity, that perhaps that provides the best possible uh, solution uh, to this inclusive uh, process. Uh, but uh, by taking these preventive measures alone, the situation will not improve unless proactive steps are taken. And the proactive steps from our point of view would include, obviously, the successful uh, political transition, the uh, uh, election recount, vote recount, and also uh, the establishment of a government of national uh, unity. There are issues involved. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be... Everything is not going to be hunky-dory, but that's something which is of paramount importance. Security transition, because as of now, we don't know whether the Afghan security forces, after the withdrawal of all uh, foreign forces, they would be able to withstand the pressure. Uh, today, I was reading this morning in the uh, news that in Kunduz province of Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban, uh, there was a pitched battle going on between uh, the Afghan security forces and Taliban to take over that city, that province. So that's, these are the kind of things which have already uh, begun to take shape. And then economic transition. Economic transition is uh, a very important. The transformation of Afghanistan's economy from a war economy uh, to a peaceful and stable economy is something which is of paramount. Uh, importance. Um, there, um, um, what is required to be done? Um, I think the uh, important thing is that um, uh, what is the way forward? I think the way forward in terms of Afghanistan, Pakistan is number one, uh, recognition of uh, this border. Uh, Afghanistan does not recognize this 27 
100 kilometers long border because of uh, uh, some political reasons in Afghanistan. There are certain political groups who uh, uh, do not, who feel that this is, this is the border that was drawn by the Britishers in 1885 um, uh, with King Abdul Rahman and um, with the passage of time, uh, it has lost its validity. Uh, that's, the, uh, that, that's their uh, standpoint. Uh, I mentioned about the peace and reconciliation, and then I think there, is, uh, there has to be a regional consensus on non-interference in Afghanistan. It is extremely important that we have a regional consensus for non-interference in Afghanistan because, uh, uh, be, because the regional countries should not uh, feel threatened in case there is a uh, security arrangement that Afghan government has worked out with other countries. Similarly, um, we have concerns in Pakistan that, uh, uh, that the, the territory of Afghanistan is being used by India to destabilize Pakistan by uh, uh, encouraging uh, Baloch dissident elements. And these are the kind of things that um, uh, th there has to be uh, an end to this kind of a, uh, uh, problems. Uh, uh, the, uh, we, I talked about the economy. Um, there, was a, uh, uh, there was an agreement in Kyoto, in Tokyo, uh, in 2012, to, um, to, that after the withdrawal of uh, ISAF forces, uh, $15 billion were committed for uh, the economic revival of Afghanistan, and I think those pledges is something that uh, must be upheld. Uh, obviously, uh, 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 creating employment opportunities, development of infrastructure um, is something that would also is important because infrastructure development would also bring about employment opportunities. Uh, I mentioned that between Pakistan and Afghanistan, recognition of border is uh, something which is very important. Uh, an end to safe havens on both the sides is again uh, of uh, terrorist is very, very important. Uh, for a very long time, um, North Waziristan uh, was termed as an area which uh, had become the safe haven for uh, all kinds of foreign elements, but now that we have launched operations and we have cleared almost 80% of North Waziristan and uh, uh, the remaining 15-20% uh, we will be able to clear in the next four to six weeks. I think a similar action in the uh, province of Nuristan and Kunar in Afghanistan has to be undertaken because most of these people who have fled North Waziristan, they have made um, uh, Nuristan and Kunar provinces of Afghanistan as into their safe haven. So a similar action is required to be taken. Uh, economic cooperation is another area. Um, we are already cooperating economically. Pakistan has also contributed to the uh, economic development of uh, Afghanistan. Despite our meager resources, we have contributed almost $500 million in developing infrastructure projects, in building a hospital, in building a university, in building uh, schools, in eye hospital, and a road network from uh, Torkham to Jalalabad. Uh, so these, this, this is something, the contribution that we have made. And plus, uh, we have offered um, scholarship to 6,000 uh, Afghan students to study in uh, various Pakistani educational institutions. Uh, development of joint projects is something that is uh, desirable between our two countries. An end, end to hostile propaganda is, again, something which is of paramount importance. And then um, um, uh, uh, I think the uh, regional connectivity projects, projects would also bring about a large uh, degree of stability in Afghanistan. We are pursuing CASA 1000, we are uh, pursuing TAPI, uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline. And we also want to develop an, uh, a road network, a rail network between Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, Turkey, and uh, other countries. I think I have spoken enough. I'll stop here, and I'll be very happy. 
to respond to any question that you may have. And I promised uh, dear friend uh, Charles that um, I'll be, I won't mind a no hold bar <laughs> uh, discussion. <laughs> It's on. We'll be collecting some questions here as, uh, as we get going. So if you have any questions, place them on the card. People will be collecting them on the side coming down. We have one down here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, first, thank you so much for your honest and very frank comments. They were much appreciated. I think some of us might have come with a little bit of uncertainty, and uh, you proved yourself right when you talked to me earlier that you were going to be honest and frank, and I think we'll get some honest and frank questions. That would be my guess. Let me start with one that I'm sure is going to be on some of these cards, because you didn't deal with it too much, and that's the border relations between India and Pakistan. You talked a lot about Afghanistan and Pakistan. Today, as I understand it, there was a flag uh, meeting on the border, and the ceasefire um, has been, uh, I guess, held for a short while. But uh, Prime Minister Modi went to Kashmir not uh, more than a month ago, I believe, um, suggested that Pakistan was at fault on some of the problems on the border. I wonder if you could just comment on what your sense is about the Kashmiri border problems and what is that what is the, the future of that uh, source of relations between India and Pakistan? You know, I, Go ahead. <laughs> Whatever. I think it's on. Uh, yes. You know, the, uh, the firing across the line of control is something which is uh, not desirable at all. Uh, I just, I was director general in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 2003 dealing with South Asia that uh, we offered uh, a ceasefire on the line of control, and that ceasefire held for a long time between our two countries. It is very unfortunate that this, these firing incidents have resumed. But um, I think it is um, 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 uh, the best thing for us to do is to, to engage in um, uh, regular discussions, not only between the, the uh, military commanders of the uh, two countries who are deployed on the line of control, but also a consistent, uh, uninterrupted dialogue is something which is also of paramount importance. Uh, I am very happy uh, that the director generals of military operation from both the countries, they had a meeting, uh, and they um, uh, have agreed to, to cease fire on the line of control. We only hope that this uh, cease fire is not violated. Um, uh, the, uh, I think we need to um, also look at the reasons as to why this, uh, uh, the, uh, these violations they take place uh, uh, on, a, on a regular basis uh, since last year. Uh, we, uh, we have a certain, Pakistan has a certain point of view with regard to these violations. The Indians, they have a certain point of view. But uh, certainly, uh, I would like to believe that, um, uh, for instance, since our army is uh, uh, is facing a, a threat from the uh, on the western border. A bulk of our troops are already deployed there. Uh, secondly, uh, most of our troops are also deployed on internal security duties to fight uh, forces uh, involved in terrorism and extremism. So it is certainly not in our interest to uh, to violate the the uh, sanctity of the line of control. Uh, and um, that's why I would like to believe uh, that uh, we need to have these uh, uh, violations investigated in, in a proper fashion. As a matter of fact, we had, uh, we had suggested only uh, uh, recently that uh, six months ago when similar violations were taking place that we will be happy to, uh, to involve the uh, United Nations Military Observer Group for India and Pakistan, which is deployed on the line of control, to investigate as to who is the, uh, who is the uh, aggressor and who is the victim. Thank you. Thank you. I think one of these questions, I think, probably helps us open it up from just the tri trilateral relations we've been talking about here between Pakistan, India, and Afghanistan. 
And the question is, can you discuss the growing role of China in South Asia? And I think a lot of us are seeing China expand its political influence, not just in, in your part of the world, but also in Africa and other developing regions. Um, can you comment on China, the relationship between China and Pakistan, and then its influence overall in the Pakistan, Afghanistan, India region? Well, um, you know, we need to understand that uh, China is, um, is a very big power. We, um, in, in our part of the world, we enjoy, uh, you know, if you look at the geography of Pakistan, we have 27, 2,900 kilometers long border with India. We have, uh, uh, we have 1,000 kilometers long border with Iran. We have 2650 kilometers long border with, um, with uh, Afghanistan, and we have 900 kilometers long border with, uh, with, uh, with uh, China. So accordingly, as is the case with most countries in the world, there is a lot of um, economic activity that takes place between Pakistan and China. So China, certainly, um, uh, after the signing of the uh, uh, FTA between Pakistan and uh, China, our trade with China has grown uh, phenomenally in the last uh, several years. Plus, we are also engaged in a, in a number of connectivity projects. For instance, China is developing this, uh, we are developing this economic uh, corridor between the Chinese pro province of Kashgar to the newly established port of Gawadar in Balochistan in Pakistan. And that would involve the construction of a road link between Gawadar and uh, Kashgar. It would also involve the construction of railway track between Gawadar and... Uh, so once this project is complete, um, these networks are completed, and if you uh, look at the... Uh, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the idea to establish uh, uh, industrial zones along the route, you can well imagine the kind of economic development that the area is going to witness in the next 15, 20 years from now. Now, this is, some, say, this is something, the economic uh, uh, component, uh, you know, that part. Uh, traditionally, uh, again, um, uh, we enjoy a very, frank, very fr friendly and uh, very cooperative relationship with, uh, with uh, China. And we are witnessing that the same trend is also in vogue in many of the other uh, regional countries, um, including India. India is also, if you look at the development, they are also developing their relationship with uh, China uh, in, a, in a very sustained and a very consistent manner. Let's keep on the economic front for a second. Um, Pakistan's GDP growth, I think, is in the range of 4%. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Yes. And uh, which is very difficult to sustain true growth and economic prosperity at that level for a developing economy. Uh, the IMF uh, dispersed another $550 million to Pakistan in June, I believe, and continues to support the country. Um, what are the prospects for Pakistan being uh, more economically independent and growing at a faster rate, similar to many other countries, let's say, in Southeast Asia, that grow at perhaps double that rate? Um, what are the prospects for this in Pakistan, which could help, I think, a lot in making it a, uh, an easier country to, to, to exert uh, political power in the region? You know, as far as the economy is concerned, there are wonderful things, things which are happening in Pakistan. Uh, for instance, the economy uh, has registered an impressive growth from 3.1% to 4.1% in the last one year. And if we look at the report, the recent report that has come out from the IMF and the World Bank, that shows that the next, next year it is going to, uh, to reach almost 5%. So that's the kind of an economic projection that Moody's, the international rating agency, has also termed Pakistan as, you know, has Im improved Pakistan's rating from negative to stable uh, in the last one year because of the, uh, the great uh, economic progress that was being achieved. As a matter of fact, the government has introduced a number of reforms which uh, will begin to uh, produce results. For instance, the, uh, in order to increase, uh, improve tax to GDP ratio, a lot of things have uh, uh, have been done. Steps have been taken. Tax collection has uh, increased. Um, uh, the uh, 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 foreign investments have also improved. Um, 
uh, JETRO, this Jap Japanese uh, agency, has also uh, termed Pakistan as the most favorite uh, destination for investments. And we are witnessing, for instance, in the last one year, if last year we are, the foreign direct investment in Pakistan was $1.6 billion, this year we have witnessed $2.9 billion, almost $3 billion this year. So this is the trend that we think uh, is likely to continue uh, in the foreseeable future. And uh, I think uh, with the kind of uh, 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 things, for instance, I today I was uh, in Midlands and I could see that there were a lot of people who were interested, particularly uh, going to Pakistan in the oil and gas sector because uh, according to the U.S. Uh, uh, geological uh, uh, assessment, Pakistan has one of the largest uh, uh, reserves of oil, gas, and shale gas, and shale oil. And these are the kind of things which uh, we, are, we want to, would like to exploit. The problem that we could not attract uh, enough foreign investment into these sectors was that our, the prices that we were offering, uh, previously they were very low, but in the last uh, six months we have doubled the in incentives and today we are offering almost uh, six to nine dollars per MMBTU uh, for to foreign investors, which is being uh, found as very very attractive. So I think things are getting much better. Well, any trip to Houston has to talk about energy, so I'm glad to hear you had time to do that when you weren't asking all these answering all these political questions. So here's one. What is the status of Pakistan's nuclear testing? And I knew this is probably going to be a fastball you would expect. Um, and is this going to improve? What are the relations here between you, India, and the whole nuclear question? Um, you know, the, uh, uh, I should have mentioned, uh, but since the uh, topic was slightly different, uh, relationship between Pakistan and the U.S., are on a very, very positive trajectory now, and the kind of uh, good uh, cooperation that we are getting on economy and trade, economy from on the energy sector, and also defense cooperation, and also on the nuclear area. Uh, for instance, because I brought this up because uh, we are having a, uh, a great dialogue on nuclear non-proliferation and strategic stability. Uh, you will be happy to learn that um, uh, we, uh, uh, we have been placed, according to the uh, National uh, Threat uh, Institute, um, it's a, a very prestigious uh, institute dealing with nuclear issue, Pakistan has been placed ahead of uh, other countries in terms of uh, the safety and security of its uh, nuclear material and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, facilities. Uh, so that's something that we really feel uh, proud of. Uh, Secretary Kerry in his uh, press conference in The Hague during the Nuclear Security Summit in Hague had also termed Pakistan as a role model when it comes to uh, ensuring safety and security of its nuclear weapons. Uh, there is a regular dialogue that has taken place between Pakistan and the U.S. We have, uh, uh, we have declared a moratorium uh, on, uh, on, on um, uh, further testing, and that's something that we would like to stick to. A question, a couple of questions here deal, deal with similar things, but let me just uh, ask one this way. Is the Pakistani military today under civilian control, or in the past it's been politicized? What, what is your view on the status of the Pakistani military today? You know, this is an interesting question. And in every interaction that I have, uh, whether here, whether in India, whether in other <laughs> countries in the world, I am asked this question. And I ask a counter question, is it any different from the other countries uh, that we are talking about? Um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, I can, the foreign policy or the uh, defense policy formulation process, I think in every, every country is quite similar. Uh, if my understanding is correct, uh, the uh, all policy issues in the United States of America, they are circulated amongst various stakeholders, which includes uh, obviously uh, you know the president in in the chair, the vice president because he represents the Congress, 
Secretary of Defense, Chairman Joint Chief, uh, Director CIA, Director uh, the National Security Advisor, so all these, and Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury. They, they get together, they discuss the issues, uh, and then a decision is taken. Um, in certain cases, in many cases, uh, we have seen that, uh, or, and this is something which has been written about, that the, uh, the, uh, the views of the uh, DOD or Pentagon or CIA would carry the day uh, in terms of some, some issues, foreign policy issues. And uh, in other issues, sometime it is the uh, State Department, sometime it is the uh, National Security Advisor. So now when we look at the uh, situation in Pakistan, the situation in Pakistan is not any different. Uh, from the, we follow the same process. We have a cabinet committee on national security, which is chaired by the prime minister and represented by uh, four cabinet ministers. And you have the army chief, you have the director of uh, director general of CIA, who is part of the. So these issues are debated, and then we have a very lively debate. I was also a part of this uh, uh, committee before coming to Washington. And, we, and the decision was taken uh, through a process of consultation and consens consensus. Uh, this question has certainly become a cliche. Um, uh, to, I have seen criticism here in this country that in the case of Afghanistan, it is not the, uh, uh, and this is something which has been written about by the former, even the former Secretary of State, um, Condoleezza Rice in her book, that there used to be a tug of war between the state and the, uh, and the DOD on, these, on issues related to Afghanistan or other flashpoints. Uh, in the case of India, for instance, the uh, uh, political leadership of the two countries, the former Prime Minister of Pakistan, uh, late Benazir Bhutto, and late uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, they signed an agreement on Siachen Glacier issue. And in recent uh, uh, years, the agreement was vetoed by the Indian Army, and this is something which is a well-known fact. Uh, so what do you say, whether uh, now it is uh, the changing of the... So the uh, in any conflict situation, my own assess sense is that uh, people who are on the ground, somehow their opinion is given more weightage. And that is that holds true in the case of whether it is the United States of America, whether it is Pakistan, or whether it is um, India, or other countries for that matter. Thank you. Thank you. Let me um, finish with one final question. There are, there are many others here, but for the sake of time. Uh, we, if we look out 10, 20, or 30 years, we have seen recently, or over the last decade, the emergence of the Taliban again, the emergence of Al-Qaeda and now the emergence of ISIS. Um, extremist groups, and this is where you started your remarks on the comments around extremism. How can Pakistan, and for that matter, all the countries, the major political organizations in your region, stem the growth of these extremist organizations so they aren't a threat not just to your region but to the globe as they seem to be today? You know, it is, uh, that Terrorism thrives in conflict situations. Uh, the terrorism thrived during the Afghan war, terrorism thrived during uh, Pakistan-India tension, terrorism thrives during tensions between uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. I think the, uh, the best way to, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to tackle this issue is to cooperate. Uh, there has to be a cooperative mechanism between uh, the three countries of the region. Uh, Pakistan, India, and Afghanistan. Uh, uh, but terrorism is an important issue. Uh, it is of as much concern to Pakistan as it could be for any other country. Uh, but the way to uh, deal with this issue is to cooperate in a very sincere and a very uh, committed fashion. Uh, unfortunately, in the last several years, uh, and any watcher of Pakistan-India relations for that matter would uh, testify to this point of view that uh, incidents of terrorism in either country, whether in taking place in Pakistan or India, have been used as an opportunity to blacken the face of the other. I think we need to overcome this, uh, this uh, phenomena. We need to cooperate. 
Uh, what we have suggested, for instance, to the Indian side is that this is a, a serious issue. We need to have a mechanism at the level of the national security advisors of the two, two countries, aided by the, their respective uh, 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 other government agencies. That's a, a high-level area, and I think uh, the same kind of a uh, uh, phenomena or a mechanism can also be worked out between Pakistan, India, and Afghanistan. And just as a B part of that question, what would be your advice to President Obama and the State Department in their role looking forward towards helping in this area? Well, uh, you know, uh, 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 North Waziristan has been in the news for the last several years for all the wrong reasons. Uh, now that we have cleared the area, I think the uh, best thing that we can do is to uh, develop Waziristan. Uh, we need to, there was a proposal many years ago to develop uh, reconstruction opportunity zones in North Waziristan, in Waziristan uh, to develop infra infrastructure in Waziristan, to develop industries in uh, Waziristan, uh, so that it, you know, people of the area could get employment, they could uh, get e economic benefits. Uh, Waziristan is an area uh, that if we develop that area, that would benefit not only Afghanistan, but also Pakistan. Uh, so you know that's something. So what, what I am saying, telling people in Washington is that now at this stage, when we have cleared North Waziristan of all the bad guys, we need to uh, pool in our resources to, uh, to develop the infrastructure, to develop uh, the houses which have been destroyed uh, through aerial bombardment that was carried out by us or the schools which were destroyed, or the uh, mosques which were destroyed, so that when the one million or so IDPs, when they go back to North Waziristan, they find a decent infrastructure to live in, and some kind of a skill development mechanism so that they can become. They are peaceful people, but we have one million of them, IDPs living in camps, and wonderful people, uh, both men and, and they're extremely happy that we have uh, we have carried out these uh, military operations in order to clear the area. They are determined that in case they are empowered, they would not allow those people to come back to. And uh, we, will, we will obviously help them, but uh, this monster which was created by all of us uh, can only be tackled by pooling our resources, joint resources. And I think uh, Joanne, uh, she knows it very well because... Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the dynamics in that area is something that we need to pool in our resources in order to get rid of this phenomenon. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Pakistan was created in 1947. Um, it has 170 million people today. Um, its GDP has grown 10 times or more since that point in time. Um, it's been an ally and a friend of the United States throughout that 67-year period. You're certainly a friend and an ally of the Asia Society Texas Center. We're thrilled that you could come and join us here this evening. We thank you for your honest and open remarks. We have a little gift, I think, don't we, Kelly? Oh, it's right here. How about that? That wasn't my idea. And we thank you once again for joining us this evening, Mr. Ambassador Jelani. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this interaction. I only wish that, uh, uh, you know, contrary to what I had expected, the uh, questions which were posed to me were relatively easy and very civilized. <laughs> Thank you. You're in Texas.